Fantastic, Brent. So thank you for 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 taking us really through through a speedy but but highly effective tour through uh, the patterns of inequality across the globe from uh, from the years eighteen twenty to to now. So so that was really interesting, and you've thrown up a number of really important questions around um, how we would think about, about uh, patterns of inequality uh, kind of going forward uh, from here. So we have about 45 minutes for a, for a uh, kind of set of Q&A and for us to share some thoughts and uh, kind of raise a few issues for, for, uh, for us to debate. And there's three, three ways in which we can, we can engage. The first is for me to now uh, kind of ask anyone who's online or else who's in the room who would like to ask a question or make a, 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 a comment to kind of indicate and what we can do is if you're online we can we 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 can unmute you and we can give you the uh, kind of opportunity to ask to ask your question uh, or make the uh, 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 comment that you'd like to make uh, directly to the whole audience while that is is going on um, anyone who feels more com com uh, comfortable to ask today to their kind of questions on the chat or on the Q&A session, you should feel free to do that. And we'll try to select a few of those questions, uh, kind of group them and uh, put them to Branko. So let's start with the, with the first part and check if there's anyone online who would, would like to ask to ask a question or share a thought with us. If you could just indicate by raising your hand and we can we can then unmute you from here. Um, I'm not yet seeing any hands, so maybe let's go to the online online question. Uh, uh, Renko, let's start with the uh, 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 with the uh, uh, with the kind of question from uh, uh, Robert Mutzova, who asks, uh, to what extent has colonialism and imperialism, um, and imperialism uh, 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 contributed to global inequality, particularly from the perspective of Africa? Uh, well, this is an ex excellent question. What, what I can contribute here, and I hope I'm contributing that, is to illustrate uh, that the 19th century was the century where these large gaps have been created. Uh, I cannot show, there is no sort of uh, way causally to show how colonialism and imperialism actually prevented the growth of countries that did colonialism. But the, the very fact that uh, gaps once originally created were such that enabled the stronger countries to control other countries and possibly, and actually of course this is among economic historians that the debate, uh, possibly to prevent their uh, their technological change and and the rise. I mean, obviously the 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 example that many people quote is the industrialization of India. Uh, so I I, I cannot uh, based on the data that I have I cannot prove the causality. I can just simply note that the 19th century was the century where these large gaps have been created. It coincided with, uh, with the century of colonialism. 
and that was the century where both forces of within inequality and between inequality were on the rise. Okay. Thank you. So we have a hand up from uh, from Juanele. Uh, I've lost the surname now, but we so it's it's uh, uh, we we're uh, kind of about to unmute you. Uh, 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 from, so so a a kind of question. Thank you very much. And over to you, Panela. Yes, go ahead. I can hear you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, Prof. Look, um, I understand that maybe Africa has um, an opportunity to be an equalizing power in global uh, inequality. But if we are look at if we are looking at African economies, um, they are still largely driven by extractivism. Uh, South Africa, for instance, remains a Western enclave, imperialist enclave, um, in which resources are extracted. Uh, but my question will be briefly, with the shift uh, in the global south, there is an understanding that um, the, glo the global south is agitating for a shift from the Western hegemony. Um, this is underscored by the emergence of um, BRICS. What does this mean for the prospects of growth for, for countries such as South Africa um, and Brazil? Um, the alignment with the likes of India and China in terms of growth, uh, but also um, following on a path uh, that will actually um, have an impact on inequality within the global south. Uh, of course, this question takes me further afield because it goes into more political arena, but you know, I'm willing to, to do that. So uh, in my opinion, the South, the Global South, is now in a very unique and relatively strong position. L let me just explain why I mean that. Like if you go back 40 years, and I am old enough to remember that, when you had, of course, the group of 77, when you have the attempt to have new economic international order, uh, the, the South was uh, producing 20% of the global GDP. Now, the South is producing more than 50% of the global GDP. Now, obviously, it's mostly like India, China, Indonesia, and so forth. But the power of the South has increased. And I think that power should be used uh, uh, smartly uh, to basically change some of the rules of the international economic order, including, for example, the role of the IMF, the voting power in the IMF and the World Bank, the, the role of the United Nations, the role of the uh, World Trade Organization, uh, that were all essentially based on 1945, and then later like with WTO, based on the issues that are of largest concern to the rich countries. I mean, I'll give you an example of intellectual property rights. That's clearly something that was of huge concern to the uh, North, it was much less for the others. So I think in that sense, I'm optimistic. I think this is the, the situation has now changed. The, the relative power has shifted in favor of the South and it is probably time to, to use it. Well, there's a, a, a kind of related question, Branko, from, uh, from Eduardo, uh, 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 I hope I'm, 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 that I'm pronouncing the surname properly. Uh, and the question is, uh, so your, your, kind of your talks sort of spoke about the rise of China and, and its effect on, on, on kind of changing global the levels of inequality. The question is, uh, the kind of question is, why did global, why did global, uh, why did globalization from the nineteen eighty to two thousand and eight uh, 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 favor Asia and not favor Africa? 
Um, and as we now enter a period of globalization, especially in the US, uh, do you expect global inequality to rise? Um, in other words, is globalization the only solution to global inequality? So a three-part question. Firstly, any thoughts on what, why the, the 1980 to 2008 period favored Asia and not Africa? Do you think we're going to see rising inequality um, as and as we enter a period of deglobalization, and what does that mean for globalization um, as a process that that sort of changes international global inequality? Okay, well, <clears throat> these are difficult questions. I will be very brief on them. On the first one, I think it's it's a huge question. I think that essentially what China did was on a grander scale follow the developments that happened previously in the rest of Asia uh, with uh, uh, South Korea, Japan first and South Korea and Taiwan. So there was a certain geographical proximity. There was learning from each other uh, that was not available in Africa. So in other words, uh, uh, China maybe with hindsight now seems to us to have done what one should could have expected given the similarity of conditions and geographical proximity, and actually the U.S. willingness to start importing from China, because uh, one forgets that the, the starting point of Chinese development was its rearrangement of the relations with the United States. If there was no rearrangement of, of the relations with the United States, uh, China probably would not have developed the way that it did. Uh, the second point, I'm pessimistic on the continued globalization because of the fact that the US, which was the main engine of globalization ideologically, has now sort of gone into a different direction and uh, is influencing, of course, the countries that are its partners to, to some extent, deglobalize. Uh, which I think is bad because I think that globalization was a force that led to also large increases in incomes and reduction in poverty and even reduction of inequality. And third point, can of course the same effects be realized even with much less globalization? Technically, yes, you, you don't need necessarily globalized market, but I think in practice it's, it's more difficult and just to give you an example that you know much better than I, but the African Union and different African customs unions and all of that have not been very successful precisely because there is uh, no significant variety in what to export or to import. In other words, if you grow, you actually would like to sell something to somebody else and then buy something that you don't produce at home. Uh, the, the, the bright part, I think, in, in terms of African development, it seems to me, is the uh, leapfrogging in the new technologies, particularly linked with uh, information technology, where Africa is actually uh, just simply done what China has done as well. It's just leapfrog. So forget about one type of development, just go to the very next one. So that's a very, I think, favorable part of the of development. Uh, but I think in absence of globalization, uh, everything would be more difficult. And that makes me in part pessimistic about the, the, uh, the rest of the century. Great, Brento, thank you. So let's take the kind of question from Zohab. But before I read out the question, just to, to kind of again stress, we would like to give people the opportunity to ask the kind of questions uh, 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 directly. So if you, you want to take that opportunity, please feel free to raise your hands and we'll, we'll then unmute you and allow you to ask the question. But in the meantime, let's, let's take the question, uh, let's take the question from the head, uh, Khan, whose question to you, Branko, is what do you think South Africa and other uh, 
black African uh, uh, countries can do about inequality, uh, especially with uh, uh, kind of challenges like climate change, uh, the fact that we're starting with quite uh, with quite high uh, levels of inequality. So, first part of the question is kind of any thoughts from you um, on what the large uh, countries in Africa can do, uh, and then part B uh, is is uh, 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 is 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 there a likelihood that the Asian uh, kind of strategy could be uh, 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 kind of could be repeated in Africa? You know, on the first question, it would be obviously a presumption from me to kind of I mean, say what the countries that I don't know well should do. But I think in the case of South Africa, I would really uh, see Brazil as a, how should I say? as a country to imitate or to learn from. Uh, Brazil, of course, as you know, Brazil and South Africa were uh, generally considered as the most unequal countries in the world. There are some exceptions, Guatemala, maybe Colombia, at some point Namibia, but these are very large countries. These are large countries that have many similarities in that sense, in terms of level of income, technological development, both of them have sectors which are very technologically advanced. Uh, racial uh, differences are also very present. And uh, Brazil has been reasonably successful in uh, stopping the increase and even reversing the increase in inequality. And the role that was played by uh, generalized the transfers, as you know, which are cash transfers that are even non-conditional, uh, although it was not much money, but it did have an impact. So I would say, you know, Brazil seems to me a good example to, to, to emulate or at least find out what they have done. Um, uh, I'm sorry, what was the second question? I, I just skipped my mind now. The, uh, the, mind. Part, the part B was uh, your thoughts on uh, the possibilities for African uh, 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 countries to 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 follow exactly the same model that the Asians do. Uh, I, I don't know. This is really, of course, a much more difficult question. Uh, I I think that the underlying conditions are different. Uh, you know, China benefited. I forgot to say that, and of course. Uh, Japan and uh, Korea, South Korea and Taiwan are from also a very educated labor force and they benefited from the fact that population growth rates were actually slowing down. And as you know, China had a policy of 30 years of intentionally, voluntarily, I mean, not voluntarily from the individual point of view, but voluntarily from the government point of view, or slowing population growth rate down. So these are not, it seems to me, the conditions that are prevalent in, in Africa. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure that Africa can uh, follow the, the Asian path easily. So I want to... And it would be bad form for me to not ask you the climate change change question, and I'm going to take the one that's uh, uh, come up from uh, 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 Petra uh, from Petra and uh, uh, Linen, who says that uh, that that climate change or climate uh, 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 collapse uh, will kind of have a huge impact. Um, in the near future, um, and how do you see it affecting the nature of growth uh, uh, and in the West? And if I can just tap onto that, a question about what you think climate change means for countries in the global South. So to link it to the pre to 
to the previous question, Branko, the what what China successfully did was to was to use the industrialization process with uh, large and massive investments in uh, in in kind of energy to drive uh, to drive a process which kind of economists would would <laughs> would think of as a a pretty standard structural transformation of the process. China went from being a largely kind of rural agricultural economy to an urban uh, 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 kind of industrial economy. So it's the it's the classic example of structural transformation. What I think I think climate change does is to is is to close off that pathway in the way that that the economics literature has certainly thought about the process of growth. So what are your thoughts on how climate change is is likely to to kind of affect these growth processes? And what do you think the the markers are around what what we need to think about in terms of, of kind of global income distribution? You know, my uh, my views on that have changed in the last maybe three or four years. I was more optimistic, maybe being an economist, I was more optimistic on the ability to control to some extent, to a large extent, the climate change through the usual mechanism of subsidies, and taxes. I still believe that it is important. But I've noticed two things in the last four or five years which make me more pessimistic. The first is that it seems that the climate change is the effects of the climate change are more dramatic and more sudden than we were expecting. Secondly, that they are also more variable in the sense that there are greater fluctuations and greater unpredictability. Secondary, second, um, for climate change to be addressed one way or another, even if it was not getting worse, you need international cooperation. I think we have to come to a conclusion that this international cooperation is not forthcoming. And not only that it's not forthcoming, it is, it is likely to be even less forthcoming in the future given the current conditions in the world where basically you have an undeclared trade conflict between the US and China, and also undeclared war between NATO and Russia. And then you have this idea of, which is now I think very strong, getting stronger in the US, of friend shoring or basically the creation of trade blocks. So the question that then, then I ask, and that's why I'm pessimistic, if the changes are more dramatic and worse, and our, meaning the world's, ability and willingness to actually work on that jointly, because we know that we cannot work on the climate change individually, if that willingness is less, then what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that we are actually worse off in both terms in the actual objective changes that we are witnessing and in our ability to confront them or to address them. So that made me, I think, much more pessimistic. And actually my recent paper, I actually mentioned that. I'm not a specialist in climate change, but I've observed these two phenomena. And of course, I've read that Africa would be especially badly hit because of the, its location and because it depends quite a lot on agriculture. So, you know, uh, as I said, I'm, uh, uh, I have moved from, a, how should I say, moderate or, or careful, optimistic view to a much more strongly pessimistic. Right. Uh, thank you, Branko. Let's, let's take the question around, um, uh, the kind of question, uh, the question around my, um, the question around my, uh, migration from selling um, um, Matthews 
But before I do that, uh, Alan Branko, I've just realized from the chat that, you, that you're still sharing your screen and we can only see a small oh, part I see. of it. Okay, let me do that. Okay, then, then, then we can... Let me close my... Uh -huh. okay, that's, I'm always that's... afraid of doing that because sometimes I close everything. So, oh, now I can see the questions. Yes, yes. So, Kamsel is asking about some issues of my, of my, of um, 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 migration. It's an area that you uh, uh, published in, she says. Uh, so, so the question is, what role is is my is um, uh, migration come across countries playing in increasing and decreasing inequality. Any any thoughts thoughts on that? You know, I uh, uh, the question was asked, and actually I didn't do that work, but there are people who did asking the following question: like, what would be in um, how much of what we observe, what I've shown you now about. Uh, inequality and recent changes in inequality. How much of that is due to the uh, differences in population growth rates? The answer is not much, actually. So, so far, that has not been a uh, significant uh, variable. But I think it will become with really dramatic differences in the population growth rates between Africa and the rest of the world. Now, it could be that the African decline, and actually, if you look at historical numbers, the decline in fertility rates more or less follows what has happened uh, elsewhere. And so we might actually have a significant you know, decline but I, in, in fertility rates, but I think despite all of that, there will be still a positive growth in Africa. Now, what does it mean for migration is the following. I've shown you this graph which shows large differences between core, median income, and of course with the means it's even greater, and African median income. Uh, and the, the physical distance, particularly between North Africa and Europe is really very small, quasi non-existent. These two shores of the Mediterranean have historically been really part of the same world. Uh, you don't need to know too much history that, that to know that uh, Rome and Egypt, uh, Greece, uh, Spain or Morocco have always been very closely related. But when the gaps in income are very large, as they are now, uh, the advantages of migration are also great. You know, if you migrate and from, let's suppose, the you know 80th percentile in Morocco and you go and become only 20th percentile in France, you would still gain in terms of your real income. So uh, I think the forces of migration are uh, there. They cannot be stopped so long as the gap in incomes is so large. And then there is another pol political problem. Europe clearly is unwilling or unable to increase its intake on migration, which would be in principle good both for Europe because it has a declining labor force and for Africa and for the reduction of global inequality. But again, political issues are there. And um, unfortunately, as I think, actually I see, we might even see much more of fortress Europe. I understand now that the, the French are considering a referendum on migration. Uh, and then, as you have seen already, the Nordic countries basically have closed the doors altogether to migration. So on that account, too, we do not see a sort of a, a very positive uh, development. So in other words, if you look at, at developments in uh, exchange of goods, exchange in services, exchange in technology, exchange in ideas, and exchange in people, in none of them do you see really an improvement, or actually you've seen all of them as sort of closing down. Let's uh, try to, to tackle the question from, from kind of Ibrahim Khalil Hassan. And I think Ibrahim's coming at the kind of issue very much from a South African 
point of view. His question is about whether you have any thoughts on uh, on policies to 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 kind of improve inequality in context where the, the middle classes, whether we we define that in terms of the mean or the median, but whether with middle class incomes are actually pretty close to the uh, 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 poverty line, and and kind of South Africa would be a a, a a a kind of good example where we have such high inequality that that kind of any views on what the middle is is actually a a a, a kind of income that is quite low. Any thoughts from you on what can be done in? In, in sort of context like those, and do you have any thoughts on uh, on on kind of some of the suggestions that have been made? For for, for example, the idea of a basic income graph. I, I really don't have much. As I said before, I think actually Latin American experience to me suggests that things can be done. You know, Latin America is the only content in the nineteen nineties. Uh, and early 2000s that has not had a uh, further increase of inequality. Now, we can say they had already high levels, but for many of the countries, they actually had a decline. And even when you adjust, because people have adjusted on the account of uh, underreporting at the top incomes and all of that, and you still have either a stable level, stable at high level, or a decline in the level. Uh, so I really cannot speak of individual policies for South Africa simply because I don't know the conditions well. But I think that Latin America is a place uh, that uh, that in that case is, uh, uh, how should I say, spreading internationally its knowledge about ability to control further increase of inequality at a very high level. You know, I don't think that that countries like Norway and Denmark are something that, that South Africa can learn from. It, the conditions are entirely different. But Latin America, yes. And I see so now other questions on the screen, which I have not seen before. So, okay, anyone, ones of those that you want to deal with, Franco, feel free to. to, to there, there was one question on that I just saw seconds ago. Uh, on uh, the use of PPPs. So let me explain that, you know, uh, you can basically use PPPs or you can use dollars at the uh, uh, at, uh, uh, exchange rate. Uh, the advantage of PPPs is that in principle, it accounts for the real welfare of people, especially, so, I mean, especially important in poorer countries because the price level in poorer countries is lower. I mean, this is something which I don't think we have to sort of disagree greatly because we know that countries like Norway or Japan are extremely expensive for a given sort of even food or for any given goods. Now, uh, the PPPs themselves are the result of a largest uh, project that was ever conducted. Actually, that project is now being done every five years approximately uh, by the UN and the World Bank. And the, the project, what the project does is actually goes over a list of a thousand prices and then creates price indices. And these PPP exchange rates are then used instead of the exchange rates, of the market exchange rates. So the gaps with market exchange rates would have been much larger, but I think they are not realistic in the sense that they don't adjust for the differences in the purchasing power. But the question was asked, can we have other indexes? Well, yes, we can. Obviously, I'm working and I presented everything today in terms of income. But obviously, you can have other things. Human Development Index includes, as you know, education, includes health. And the question mentioned uh, something, that I don't know what it is, but it is a happy planet, I think, or maybe some ideas about happiness. I'm very skeptical about happiness. But, uh, but yes, education and health, 
where uh, measurable things they are they've been studies on that they have been used the data are available so we can actually do and i think some people have done for example global inequality in education attainments global inequality global inequality in health although i think more work should be done of, of the same nature that i do for income should be very easily done for health because health varies by income category so instead of having on the vertical axis income as I do have, you can still have percentiles like what I have them on a horizontal axis, and then you can have uh, 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 level, uh, life expectancy on the vertical. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. So anyway, so that was what I wanted to say about the uh, the, the measurement and the indicator that I use. So so there was a question for the. A uh, colleague in Indonesia who was kind of raising the 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 kind of question from 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 his perspective uh, uh, that 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 what the Southeast Asian region has seen is a is 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 a sort of the the uh, dominance and the power grow of kind of of the Chinese. Of the Chinese, um, of the Chinese uh, 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 people, uh, at 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 the expense of of nationals from the countries around, uh, and and he raises similar kind of issues about segregation across the globe, for example, in the U.S. Uh, 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 kind of on race. Uh, and similarly in uh, in kind of South Africa, where uh, kind of questions of inequality are really driven by by race. Yeah, Any thoughts uh, on that, Franco? Well, I have not much to say about that. I understand that, and of course, you know, I worked. I remember actually when I was in the World Bank, I worked uh, quite a lot on Malaysia, because Malaysia is another example where you have essentially three groups, you know, Malays, Indians, and Chinese. The, the levels of income were different. Uh, the distribution was different and actually did that particular gap. Uh, for a while, actually, it was not even allowed to, uh, to, uh, to discuss that. And they were not even publishing in the household service that were not, they were publishing the data, but without an indication of, uh, uh, racial or ethnic composition that that has changed. So uh, I do think that these are obviously issues. There, as you said, they are in, in the U.S., uh, in South Africa, obviously. So in Brazil, it was now raised uh, in the question with respect to China and to Chinese. Of course, one has to distinguish in that question uh, between the Chinese who are Indonesian citizens and the, the Chinese minority that has been there for a long time, and the role of the Chinese companies that are now coming and investing in, in Indonesia. So these are obviously two different things. Um, but, uh, but yes, in principle, when there are large income gaps, average income gaps or median income gaps between the different communities, it contributes even sort of numerically to higher inequality, and it has obvious political implications. Uh, and obviously it's better not to have them, but you know, to reduce them is not easier. South Africa is actually a good example of that. Right, Franco, we've, we've come to the end of the time that we have. Before I move on to closure, I wanted to give you the opportunity to make any, any uh, uh, final remarks from your side. Well, uh, I, first, I would like really to thank you for the invitation. When we talked about that originally, maybe a year ago, it was, uh, I was very pleased. I'm actually very honored to have been invited. As I said, actually, I do hope to come uh, physically, not only like this over the internet. And then I would like to thank everybody for questions. I'm actually, and comments, I'm quite open to uh, answering them by email, you can easily find me or you can find me on Twitter. 
so I will be very happy to, to stay in contact and you're quite welcome to use the, the slides. So thanks again first for coming. I, I see there are still people in the three digits present and it was really a great pleasure for me to be with you.